how people thought of themselves. Sure. Okay, so whenever you're ready. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm the worst person over here. That's all right. <laughs> all right. My name's Kevin Cruz. I'm a professor of history at Princeton University. Okay, and just going, the first thing I noticed in your book was this issue of how people define themselves, and can you kind of explain what was happening and how people define themselves at this point? Sure. Uh, when I wanted to look at segregationists, uh, I approached them as I would any other group, which is to try to understand how they understood themselves. Uh, not to excuse or absolve them, but just to understand uh, how they understood themselves. And what I realized pretty quickly is that even though we often think of segregationists as solely being against the rights of others, against the rights of African Americans to own land, to vote, uh, to work where they want, to uh, uh, consume things they want, uh, instead, segregationists saw themselves, first and foremost, as being for their own rights. Uh, the right to select their neighbors, the right to select their children's classmates, uh, most importantly, the right to be left alone. Okay. And one thing in particular was, like, I noticed as well was, like, the neighborhood associations. And can you explain kind of how that actually evolved and how that developed? Sure. Uh, as these uh, segregationists, or even people didn't think of themselves that, as these ordinary white uh, homeowners, um, start to uh, worry about uh, uh, black homeowners moving into their neighborhoods, they band together into these neighborhood protective organizations. Uh, and they see themselves as defending the neighborhood from outsiders. Okay. And one of the first things I noticed, too, um, two parts of defense. One was, like, initially the Columbians. And this necessarily wasn't what we consider the quote. At least the book put, points this out. They weren't even considered, like, the decent organization at that point right. in time. So... How did the Colombians actually form? And then how does the KKK eventually like really take prominence? Well, not necessarily prominence, mm -hmm. but like grow in numbers. Sure, sure. Uh, the Colombians are the first neo-Nazi organization uh, in the United States, and it starts in Atlanta, and it's founded by uh, a couple of longtime fascists, uh, Homer Loomis and uh, Emory Burke, uh, and they uh, are literally you know wearing brown shirts in the streets. They're roughing up. Um, uh, 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 people that they think uh, are, are um, uh, a threat to the white race. And the big issue that they find resonates with locals in Atlanta is this defense of white neighborhoods. Uh, that if they can promise to keep blacks out of white neighborhoods, uh, that'll gain them a following. Now, they're pretty quickly run out of town. Um, uh, the local uh, uh, white leaders in, uh, in the city uh, in charge of Atlanta uh, don't like them. Uh, they're causing trouble. They're giving the city a, a bad reputation. And so they pretty quickly uh, run them out of town. Uh, the Klan, though, rises up to take their place. The Klan have been around uh, since uh, really the Reconstruction, uh, then again in the 1920s, but it comes back in the post-war period in Atlanta. And it picks up as a homegrown version uh, of, uh, or homegrown, um, excuse me, the Klan uh, rises up in, in the post-war period and takes the place of the Colombians. And it does so by presenting itself not as a foreign group, not a neo-Nazi group, but rather something uh, bound up in traditional white values in the South. Uh, and again, defending white neighborhoods is their, their first and foremost uh, uh, charge. Okay. And one thing in particular I also noticed was that we consider like the movies about the Atlanta way, obviously, but even still in the book, you point this out, like this one particular group of black elites, one particular group mm -hmm. of white elites still control the city. So how does that even play out, at least in your book, and how did that actually come to be? Sure. Uh, the biracial coalition that winds up running Atlanta in the mid-20th century is for both parts of the equation uh, a marriage of convenience. Uh, on the white side, you had uh, Mayor Bill Hartsfield, uh, who had uh, for a long time chafed under the, uh, the control that uh, rural conservative segregationists had in the state. Atlanta was always left out. Um, and he reports directly, uh, literally in some ways, to the business leaders of the town, especially uh, Bob Woodruff, the head of Coca-Cola. He refers to Bob Woodruff as my boss. Uh, he talks about Atlanta as being Coca-Cola City. He does so with pride. He, he opens events uh, toasting them with Coca-Cola. Uh, he is a, a corporate shill to the end. Uh, but he's very much uh, trying to do what the businessmen uh, think is good for the city. And they quickly come to realize that racial extremism is bad for a southern city. They watch what happens in cities like Little Rock and Birmingham, and they see that um, uh, racial violence leads to bad press. Bad press means bad publicity. And bad publicity means bad profits. Uh, they very quickly decide that if it comes down to a choice between um, uh, defending the white race and defending uh, their profit margins, they're going to defend the profit margins. The black side of things uh, happens for their own reasons. Um, uh, in the 30s and 1940s, African Americans in Atlanta um, very shrewdly decide to focus on voter registration. 
And when they decide to focus on voter registration, they make their impact known in a couple of uh, uh, unusual elections in the mid-40s, elections that happen outside the usual rules for the white primary that had often kept blacks from taking apart. And they become the difference maker. Uh, they become the key in a uh, congressional election in 1946. Uh, and once this happens, um, uh, Mayor Hartsfield quickly realizes that they're now going to be a player in Atlanta politics. And as he says later on, I realized the Negroes were going to vote, and they might as well vote for me. So he does what he can to court them. Uh, and the change in attitudes is really striking. Um, before uh, uh, blacks get the, uh, have the voting numbers that they do in Atlanta, and they've come to be about a quarter uh, of the city's uh, electorate, but before they get that number, he dismisses their demands out of hand. They say they want new black policemen, or some black policemen at all. And Hartsfield just tells them, you're going to get uh, white deacons, you're going to get deacons, excuse me. They say they want policemen. Uh, they want black policemen. And Hartsfield dismisses them out of hand. He says, you can get deacons in the white First Baptist Church before you'll get black policemen in town. But after they get the votes, they come back to him, and he simply says right away, how many do you want? It's a complete change in attitude, and it's one born out by the fact that they have political power. And so together, the business uh, alliance that's led by Hartsfield and this black community, uh, which now has a strong power of votes, uh, comes together uh, to uh, really run the city uh, on a, a motto of racial moderation. Okay. And in terms of this racial moderation, how did, for a while it seemed to work, but also in the book you point out that there was an undercurrent of people who necessarily weren't necessarily appreciative of that. So what is happening in this undercurrent at that point in time as well? Right. So the... the uh, the, the biracial coalition works well throughout the late 40s, 50s, and into the early 1960s. And it works well because it uh, succeeds in desegregating a large number of public places. Uh, the golf courses, the parks, uh, on into the schools are desegregated. The problem is, is that there are certain people who are left out of this process, and those are the white working class. Uh, it's their neighborhoods which start to integrate first. It's, uh, they're the ones who live near the parks uh, that get desegregated. They're the ones who are uh, sending their children to the public schools. Um, the white elite who uh, makes all this happen, uh, they have their private country clubs. They have private schools. Uh, they're not really taking part in this. So uh, they're desegregating spaces that they don't use. For the white working class, though, these were spaces they've long thought of as theirs. And uh, when they get desegregated, they don't see them as spaces they're not going to be sharing with blacks. They see them as spaces lost to blacks. And they quickly abandon them. And more importantly, they abandon uh, the political leaders of the city. Uh, they start to rally around candidates who are opposed to this coalition. That's the start of a, of a white backlash. Okay. And just to take one second, uh, one thing in particular I really liked about the book mm -hmm. was 